We'd like to eat more local and sustainable food, but we'll also have more mouths to feed. In 2050, that'll be 9 billion. How will we make sure that everyone has good food and enough to eat? Digital solutions will help to put a new mix of high-tech and low-tech ingredients on our plates, and sooner than we think. This is what's in store for us. A tomato is the hummer of the food world. It requires a ton of soil fertility. You go from green handjes to technique handjes. You have the green handjes well not steeds nodig, but you have well inderdaad steeds meer techniek waar je op moet kunnen vertrouwen. I mean, what I find interesting about what's going on with all of these technologies is that they're kind of changing the basic dynamic of the default position when we think about the food system. This is Backlight. Welcome to the era of abundance. Using information technology to increase the transparency of the food system is a great opportunity. The fact is, a lot of food has become a black box. When you're buying a pound of hamburger, you really know very little. You don't know what kind of animal it was. You don't know. You, you assume it was a cow. Um, you don't know, uh, wh wh you know how that animal lived, where it came from, how long ago it was slaughtered, what the diet was, all this kind of stuff. With his books about food, Author and journalist Michael Pollan has made millions of people aware of the drawbacks of our current food system. You know, it's always been my conviction that um, the more people know about how their food is produced, the better the choices they'll make. And that's very, that could be very disruptive to the food industry. A growing number of people are focusing on what our food is actually made of. Shireen Yates, working in San Francisco's technology industry, is one of them. Do you guys carry any gluten-free pasta? Yeah, we do. You do? Where? Yeah, I didn't see it. Uh, or is it? Uh, oh, wow. I feel like we just don't know how to properly feed ourselves. I mean, you look around and you see all these people with weight issues, sugar is a big hot topic, um, diabetes. Understanding exactly how to feed ourselves, to me, is one of the most exciting parts of this health revolution that um, I think we're just at the beginning of. A lot of people don't know exactly why, but the fact that there's more than 50% more food allergies among children um, than there was you know, 14 years ago. So there's been this massive increase um, in sort of how we're reacting to food. If you look at the 50s, it was all about packaged food, mass scale, supermarket accessibility, and um, refrigerators and freezers were starting to get really popular. And now you're seeing this total shift, more farm to fork, you know, that fresh local connection. All right, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Great. Good. Do you guys do any of your marinade in soy sauce? And I'm asking because I'm, I'm gluten allergic. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, is that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Well, our brine pork chops are delicious. We yeah. brine them in Meyer lemon and some herbs. We also have marinated buffalo chicken wings, too. Oh. Great for What's our, the marinade? Um, Callie, what's the marinade on the, on the chicken wings again? I started to get pretty sick in university. I went to go to a doctor and I was lucky enough that they made the connection that it might be food allergies and I did all the tests and sure enough, gluten I'm very, very allergic to. So I had to retrain myself. I had to read a lot of labels, interrogate the wait staff, um, and it was hard eating out. It's always a risk when you try something new that you haven't tried before. You trust that the food manufacturer knows what they're doing, that there's no cross-contamination. And even if the label is there as, you know, this is gluten-free, you, you might look at the package and it might say, processed in a facility that also has wheat. And that's a little bit of an internal alarm um, for me. Just, I, I have to raise my eyebrow at that. Are these new too? I've never seen these. There's an increased kind of distrust now. You know, there's, people have lost faith in the food supply system and they're very fearful. They're worried about being poisoned about their health. 
And to me, it seems like there's this interesting tension now between, on the one hand, the desire for what is like cheap and plentiful, and on the other hand, the desire for what is like clean and sustainable and healthy. And I think that this sort of tension is, is, is very interesting and not really resolved. In his book, The Virtues of the Table, philosopher Julian Baggini poses ethical questions about the food that we eat. Trust is a really interesting and important issue. Um, the, the supply chains are, are so large. Now, I think the real issue over trust is that there's kind of no substitute for the direct relationship and the transparency. And the mistake people make a lot of the time is they, instead of going for that kind of trust, they go for the, like the certificate or the stamp or the procedure or the system. And they say, we've ticked these boxes, so it's all okay. The problem with any tick box system is that once that's set up, someone finds a way of ticking the boxes and you know, getting away with things. Yeah, there weren't really, there were all sorts of safeguards that were meant to mean that it was impossible for horse meat to end up in a supermarket lasagna. But they didn't work because all it takes is at one point in that chain, someone to tick a box and be dishonest and you're gone. The technology is becoming more accessible and the interest is there. There's just this heightened awareness and I think that has drawn a lot of attention to the space that has been very much overlooked. And I th the real interest to me is how are you empowering the consumer to make better choices in their everyday life. There's a new generation of entrepreneurs with a background in companies like Facebook and Google who are working to make our food system healthier and more sustainable. Shireen Yates, for example, who came up with a device that can check your food for gluten within a couple of minutes. Our first product is a portable sensor that can detect gluten in foods. As a user, you would basically take a sample or core of whatever you'd be testing, put it in here. Um, this would have a, a, a test strip in it, and then you'd put it in this sensor and then turn it on. Um, and then in, in a few minutes, then you'll know whether or not that uh, very trace amount of the protein of whatever you're looking for is there. But then you can actually share your test result on, uh, on an app so it can be shared with, and I, I think that's the part that I get really excited about because it scales that individual experience to make it really universally useful for other people who are trying to navigate um, eating out with food allergies. I personally think that the vast majority of people walk around feeling subpar. They don't know their optimum self. They don't know how good they could feel because there's still such a mystery about how to feed ourselves and how to fuel ourselves. And I think as we have that additional information that goes beyond allergens, that could go into pesticides, that could go into all these other realms for food, mm -hmm. the more we're gonna know how bodies are reacting to that, then it's all this wearable information and what we're learning about our bodies is, are gonna fuse with what we're putting in our bodies and you can have this real great custom connection of, okay, this is how this particular set of inputs in my body makes me feel. And if I cut this out, then, or if I add this in, then um, I'm gonna be my best self. So that's, that's, that's what I'm really excited about. Food scanners could play an important part in making the food industry more transparent. And these scanners won't just detect gluten. Currently, scanners are being developed that can measure anything from calories and pesticides to antibiotics. Imagine if there was a way to know which watermelon is sweeter. By now, there are hundreds of different new startups in the food industry. Most of them were founded by the new generation, who are applying the advantages of the internet and digital technology to our food. It's time to bring innovation to this system. For instance, the American company Hampton Creek is using big data to develop a mayonnaise without chicken protein. One area where there's hardly any technology disruption is the world of food.
One of the investors from Silicon Valley who have moved their focus to the food industry is Ali Partovi, who got involved in internet companies like Facebook and Dropbox at an early stage. I sold my first company and I bought my first new car. And then I saw the Austin Powers movie that had this design. I instantly thought, oh, that is so cool. Flashy and unique, but not ostentatious. Why do people with a dot-com background like Partovi suddenly start investing in the food industry? A good engineer looks at a whole system kind of from the ground up and um, thinks about efficiency, thinks about, well, you know, is this the best way to have done this? This is like this because this one was like this. What if we change that? Would this be better or worse? And um, so this aspect of taking complex systems and breaking them down and simplifying them and seeing where the essence of something is. That is part of how an engineer looks at, um, looks at everything. There's a lot of VCs who have, um, you know, over the past decade, spent money and invested and cared about solar electricity or ethanol or these other um, uh, ostensibly more sustainable components of the energy world. And then there's a realization that, you know what, all of those um, Dynamics in energy apply to food and farming because food is part of the overall spectrum of energy. We're still talking about calories from the sun being converted into some storable, usable form, whether to power our cars and our machines or our bodies. The food system is responsible for somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of greenhouse gases we produce. You know, people are very aware of their cars and how they heat their house and and the fossil fuel that goes into those processes. But our food system is basically a fossil fuel uh, system as well. Um, we turn uh, fossil fuel into food in many ways. Um, the main ingredient in, um, in fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, is a fossil fuel product. Uh, and that's spread on fields all over uh, the world now. Uh, it, the process of making it consumes a lot of fossil fuel, and then when it leaches into the atmosphere, uh, it is a very potent greenhouse gas itself. Um, we also uh, process food in ways that use lots of energy. We move it around the world. That uses lots of energy. But probably the worst part is the, is the fertilizer. So there's a, there's a uh, especially meat eating has an enormous uh, role to play in, in greenhouse gas production. The uh, UN estimates about 18% of all greenhouse gases are um, uh, traceable to the animal agriculture. Um, I spent some time a couple years ago trying to figure out how much uh, fossil fuel energy, oil, it took to produce a quarter pounder with cheese. When I speak about some of these issues, particularly about the fossil fuel use in the food system, uh, I do a little demonstration and I bring a quarter pounder with cheese. Here is our oil. And I bring a pitcher of what looks like um, crude oil and four or five glasses. And, uh, and I pour them out to show you exactly how much fossil fuel goes into creating that quarter pounder with cheese. And it's 26 ounces of oil to produce that one hamburger. It's really chocolate syrup. <laughs> That's an astonishing amount of oil um, to produce something that could be produced entirely with sunlight. The moment of awakening for me, I'd say, was when I read The, uh, the Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Um, I wouldn't say that I immediately said, this, this is ready for a Silicon Valley-style disruption. Um, but I, you know, I think anyone who reads that book has a certain level of shock. For me, reading that book awakened this question of, there's obviously going to be better ways to do this, and they are probably even more profitable as well. Um, this doesn't feel like a system that was designed even for profit, let alone for being you know, the best for the world. Agriculture, by its very nature, is a solar technology. It's, it's all based on photosynthesis, the, the amazing ability of plants, and only plants, to, to take solar energy, combine it with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and water, and some minerals in the, uh, in the soil, and turn that into sugars, into food. That then can be the basis of a food chain, either feeding us directly or feeding animals. Um, this, is an, this, is, this is nature's free lunch you know, solar energy. It's the only one we have. 
And in agriculture, we harnessed it. Um, it just wasn't quite fast or efficient enough for us. And so we, we began improving on it with things like um, fossil fuel-based fertilizers and pesticides. Um, but it still works. And, it's, and, and the challenge, I think, the great challenge of our agriculture is can you put it back on a solar footing um, without turning back the clock? I'm not talking about going back to the way we grew food 75 or 100 years ago, but sophisticated, new, highly productive ways of harnessing sunlight uh, in order to, uh, to make food. In their search for a more efficient food system, investors from the field of digital technology not only consider high-tech, but also old-fashioned techniques. For instance, Silicon Valley provides a lot of financial backing for Farmland LP, an investment fund that buys arable land and converts it into organic farms with an old-fashioned rotation of crops. The view that, that we have uh, is that uh, soil is a biological system, uh, and it's actually the soil biology, the cycles in the soil biology that actually create the soil fertility. And if you uh, if you add ammonia, if you add fertilizer to soil, you're actually adding ammonia. Ammonia is basically Windex. It's what you use to sterilize things. You're killing and destroying the soil biology. So you're actually destroying the very thing uh, uh, that, you, that you really need to be there. And when, when uh, all of our agricultural practices are designed to enhance uh, the biology of the soil, to work with the biology of the soil, and that means that the soil is more fertile, you get better biological productivity, and that translates to better economic productivity. Uh, because you have the crop diversity, you don't require the herbicides and the pesticides and, and uh, some of the other, and the GMO seeds that are expensive input costs. Mm -hmm. so, after we take it through this about five-year conversion period, our costs are lower. Even if we sold the product at the same price uh, as the conventional goods, uh, our farmers would be more profitable. Uh, but that, that takes about five years. So we like the organic price premium, but after you finish the conversion period, we actually don't need it anymore. But because the demand is so large, we don't expect it to go away. When people start looking at farming as an investment, um, a place to invest their money, they discover that the most sustainable farms buy the least amount of stuff. I mean, in other words, if you're really running a sustainable farm, you don't need a lot of inputs. Inputs are usually chemicals to fix monoculture problems. You know, are the solutions in your head or are they in a bottle? In the most sustainable farming, the important solutions are in the head of the farmer. We don't use any kind of herbicides or pesticides on any of our pastures. It, you know, if we run into a weed or a pest problem, we try to manage that with our livestock. Um, you know, for instance, I have an alfalfa field back here, and last year I got some aphids in there. Um, and my neighbor next to me also had some aphids, and he elected to spray, and I elected to take and sheep it off. And, uh, you know, I generated the economics of it. I'm generating some revenue. It's costing him. And uh, when, our, when our alfalfa crop came, I got better tonnage than he did. So, you know, sometimes, you know, Mother Nature can do some great things for you if you just get out of the way. Great. Hey, how are you? Good seeing you. Good seeing you. The best pattern for sustainable agriculture is having livestock, crops, grains in a rotation, all there at the same time, just rotating among the different fields. Uh, hard for one farmer to do all that. Hard for them to grow all those different varieties, uh, and then also uh, to uh, sell them uh, all at the right time for, for the best price. And so by us operating at scale, uh, we can help each individual type of farmer, the cattle farmer, sheep farmer, vegetable farmers, uh, get all the scale that they need without having to come up with millions of dollars uh, for farmland and without spending the years that it takes to get it certified organic and, and manage it that way. So the role that we play is really that of the land steward uh, and making sure that 
we're getting the highest and best sustainable use uh, out of the farmland. And it benefits both the uh, environment uh, and the economics. So, old farming techniques, but this doesn't mean they can't be improved on. A lot of data is gathered and monitored, and both crops and farmers rotate around the fields. Uh, but this, uh, this basically shows the crop map. Uh, mm -hmm. This happens to be for 2012, but we uh, uh, color code the fields, uh, and we track a lot of information uh, about uh, what happens on the farm uh, each and every year. Uh, we use a lot of GIS uh, technology for what we do. So um, is it going to be high-tech organic farming? You say that like that's a contradictory term. <laughs> well, some people would call that a contradictory term, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. I think that growing crops is a very biological uh, function. I actually think that biology is more complicated than chemistry, uh, the systems that they're using now. So looking at the soil biology is actually more complex uh, and to me a superior way of managing the farmland. And you need to use all the tools at your disposal. A lot of people who are investing in commodity cropland uh, are keeping it in commodity corn, for example, and it's very easy to put on a spreadsheet. Uh, you're going to grow the corn, here's the input costs, here's what you're going to get. Uh, you can lock in your input costs and sell your corn before you ever uh, sit on a tractor for the year. So as a financial instrument, it looks very simple and great, and it's very linear. What we do is uh, it's we're focused on maximizing the soil biology, its systems, the, uh, the farmers are rotating, the land is rotating, and the, uh, the technologists, the Silicon Valley, uh, the people in Silicon Valley, they're systems thinkers. Uh, so they understand, uh, you know, software is not linear. <laughs> software is uh, loops and everything has to work together, object-oriented, for example. And so when they hear how we're managing farmland, they get it they get it very quickly and they get it instantly. And they also have a view towards the future. They have a view towards how can, how should the world be? In the quest for food production without the use of fossil fuels, there is another solution. What if you could grow vegetables on a large scale, locally, close to the city, and without pesticides or fertilizers? just by using electricity that can be generated by solar energy. Lettuce grower Mark Dalison from Fenlo, the Netherlands, is already doing this, and the secret formula turns out to be light. LED verlichting, that is actually the whole new draan. Door het gebruik van die LED-verlichting kunnen we hier eigenlijk altijd de lente nabootsen. En dat is eigenlijk waar het plantje zich helemaal happy bij voelt. Want lente is eigenlijk de snelst groeiende periode van het jaar. We hebben nu zeven lagen boven elkaar. Dus als je gaat kijken naar efficiëntie, ben ik eigenlijk al zeven keer zo efficiënt qua oppervlakte ten opzichte van een traditionele kas. We staan hier in een opkweekgedeelte. In het opkweekgedeelte is het uh, normaal 30 dagen van zaaien totdat het plantje ongeveer 10 centimeter uh, groot is. Um, dat is in de lente. Uh, als je dat in de winter zou doen, dan spreken we over 100 dagen. Hier in deze ledcellen hebben we dus eigenlijk altijd uh, 30 dagen nodig om het plantje van zaaien tot 10 centimeter groot te krijgen. Dit wordt dadelijk een heel lekker slaapplantje. We hebben een zoektocht gedaan naar het lichtrecept voor de groei van sla. En uiteindelijk heb je rood, uh, blauw en verrood nodig om fotosynthese te krijgen. En de juiste combinatie daarvan zorgt voor een optimale groei. Dus daar hebben wij eigenlijk uh, vier jaar naar zitten te zoeken. Dus zelfs de smaak van bepaalde producten zou je kunnen beïnvloeden door meer blauw te geven, door meer rood te geven. Maar dat staat uh, nu eigenlijk pas eraan te komen dat ze daar met onderzoek mee bezig zijn. Elke kleur heeft zijn specifieke werking en uh, ja, daar zijn de plantjes dus nog heel gevoelig voor. Dus we hebben blauw, rood en verrood. En de combinatie van die drie zorgt ervoor dat een slaaplantje doet groeien naar de wens zoals wij dat uh, graag willen zien. 
Maar het is wel zo als ze bijvoorbeeld uh, de, de kleur blauw iets meer de toevoegen, dan komt je plantje daar al heel anders uit. Dus de natuur is uh, wat dat betreft verbazendwekkend uh, hoe, dat, uh, hoe dat ze daarmee omgaat. Wat, wat gebeurt er als je er wat meer blauw bij doet, bij wijze van spreken? Of? Dan wordt die langer. Wordt die langer? Ja, strekking inderdaad. Oh. Dus je kan, kan je die plant dan echt zeg maar, sturen met allerlei verschillende ja. soorten licht? Samen met het klimaat inderdaad kun je eigenlijk, ben je helemaal in control over het plantje. Je gaat van groene handjes naar techniekhandjes. Je hebt die groene handjes wel nog steeds nodig, maar je hebt wel inderdaad steeds meer techniek waar je op moet kunnen vertrouwen. De LED techniek is momenteel gewoon nog erg duur. Je kunt eigenlijk vergelijken met de PC's in de jaren 80. Die moest je ook duizenden euro's betalen voor een kleine PC. En nu tegenwoordig krijg je al voor 150 euro kun je al een laptop kopen. Ik denk diezelfde weg moeten we nog met LED tegemoet gaan. Gewasbescherming heb ik bij de opkweek helemaal niet meer nodig. Dus dat is wel een heel groot voordeel. Het tweede grote voordeel is mijn waterverbruik, dat daalt met uh, ongeveer 80 procent. Dus daar heb je een enorme besparing op en je moet je meer voorstellen. Normaal een plantje, uh, kleine plantjes ook zodra die uh, buiten staan en de zon schijnt, beginnen die te verdampen. En daardoor krijg je inderdaad uh, verbruik van water. Hier in die ledcellen stellen we het zo in dat je gewoon altijd uh, de ideale klimaat hebt, waarbij er eigenlijk ook maar minimale verdamping is. Deze komen uit de ledcel. Dat is eigenlijk nog heel mooi te zien omdat deze eigenlijk nog helemaal groen zijn. Terwijl er eigenlijk toch twee rode varianten in zitten. Als dus je een beetje verder kijken zie je mooi de kleur al opkomen. Onder ledlicht krijg je geen kleuring omdat er geen UV in zit. En ja goed, hier vanuit de kast krijg je, krijg je dat dus wel. En dan heb je inderdaad na twee dagen dat ze mooi beginnen te kleuren. Hier is alles gecontroleerd, dat kun je buiten nooit bereiken. Well, what I find interesting about what's going on with all these technologies is that they're kind of changing the basic dynamic of the default position when we think about the food system. So what is that default position? It's really the idea that people have that agriculture is divided between the organic, or the traditional mixed farm method, you know, the kind of thing we recognize as a farm if we see it walking in the countryside. And industrial farming, biotech, all those things that are somewhat alien. They, they rely on technologies too much and are not natural. So you've got, you know, people think about it as natural and non-natural, although obviously it's more complicated than that. Well, look, there are all sorts of things about that division which are already quite problematic. But it seems to me a lot of what's going on now is kind of challenging people to really ask themselves the question, well, what matters about this divide? Growing foods in ways which, on the one hand, is, is, is entirely artificial. You're talking about using LED lights and things and keeping things in highly controlled conditions. But on the other hand, without these additives and fertilizers and everything, so it's kind of organic, in the sense that it doesn't have any of those inputs which are considered nasty. But it's not at all organic in the sense that traditionally organic is about the soil cycle. It's about growing in such a way that you feed the soil even as you grow in it. Now, once that kind of technology becomes mainstream, it's really forcing people to ask themselves the question, what really matters here? What's the important thing? What really, really matters for us? And it's no longer good enough to have this kind of neat division in your mind between all oh, natural and good and industrial and scary. Some of these things they're coming up with are arguably going to be both more productive and more sustainable than the best organic farms. People aren't going to like that very much a lot of the time because yeah, we do have a romantic attachment to the idea of the traditional farm. We weten allemaal dat we in 2050 met 9 miljard mensen zijn. Dus uh, ja, die willen allemaal graag eten. Dus we zullen sprongen voorwaarts moeten maken om die productie nog efficiënter te maken. En waarbij ook nog gekeken wordt dat we de productie krijgen op de plaatsen waar de mensen leven.
Ik denk dat dat de uitdaging van de komende jaren zal zijn. Do we really need to produce more food in order to feed 9 billion people in the future? Chef Dan Barber, who owns a restaurant just outside New York City, doesn't think this is necessary. He believes that our current harvest is enough to provide good food for everyone in the future. The premise of the question is, how are we ever going to produce enough calories to feed 9 billion people and, mm -hmm. and what is predicted for 2050? When you, I think we need to stop and relook at that question and realize that we already produce enough food to feed 12 billion people uh, right now. Um, there are, as I mentioned, a third of a population that is food insecure and starving, but that's not because there isn't enough food. Mm -hmm. That's because there is um, an unfair distribution yeah. of food. That has to do with political realities and and deep, deep uh, unfairness in the world. Producing more food is not going to help that uh, uh, at all. Um, and so, so the premise of the question for me is troubling because it, 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 it squares you off into a, into a set of, it puts you down a, a pigeonhole into a set of answers where you have to answer, well, how do we produce more food? Instead of asking, well, do we need to produce more food? And the answer is, Actually, in terms of caloric intake, we really don't. We need to distribute it better. That's a big problem. Distribution is a big problem. 60% of it is not being fed to us. Uh, it's being fed very inefficiently to animals. So you're eating meat that's fed corn and soy, but, but, but you know, we, we don't need to do that. And these animals, as we have proven here, don't need a lick of grain and can use the energy from the sun that feeds the grass and the grass feed them and they taste delicious and they're healthy for us. So that's the kind of system I think we should be supporting. The problem in the last half century has been a disconnection with how our food is produced. Because when we become disconnected with how food is produced, we generally make really bad decisions about who is growing our food and how it's getting to us. First of all, this is a carrot that is an organic carrot that you equivalent to you would get at you know, Whole Foods, right? So we squeezed a little bit of its juice. Our lovely Tara is uh, getting a reading of sugar, uh, Rick's reading, which is 4.5, which means 4.5% of this carrot is sugar. Now we're going to test uh, Stone Barn's carrot from Jack Algier, which has, by the way, been in storage for the last three months, um, grown in the best organic soil and also rotated with all the crops. And here we have a bricks of 12. So it's 12% of this carrot is sugar versus 4%. And what studies have shown is there's a correlation between bricks and, and nutrient density. There's definitely a correlation between how much you like the carrot and how much you might not like the carrot based on the amount of sugar. But local farming on organic soil is not enough, according to Barber. We will also have to adjust our diet if the definition of farm to table meant all we needed to do was shop for what we wanted locally. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get that tomato and that eggplant and that zucchini and that carrot and that onion and I'm gonna call myself farm to table. Well, no, what you need to do is dig a lot deeper and we need to, we need to support the, the crops that gave us all those crops. All the crops I just mentioned are cream crops. You know, we think about a local tomato as, you know, as the epitome of a sustainable farm-to-table system of the future. In fact, a tomato is a, is a very expensive uh, vegetable. Actually, it's a fruit, but it's a, it's a very, very expensive. From a soil fertility expensive, it's, from the soil fertility perspective, it's the hummer of the food world. It requires a ton of soil fertility. Um, what we need to do is, I, don't, I wouldn't say turn away from tomatoes, but I would say we need to celebrate those crops that give us the fertility to enjoy the tomato 
those are crops like brassicas in a rotation uh, or grain cover crops or clovers, uh, you know, cover crops that we can actually learn to eat, bean crops, leguminous crops. Uh, those are the ones that give us the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and all the building blocks for healthy soil that give us those flavors that we love so much. We tend to gravitate towards certain diets that are in vogue or in fashion or we believe to be best for us, and then we demand that the land grow it. Or we become fixated on certain trends or ideas because we think they're the most delicious, and we tend to put great demands on the landscape to grow it. Any dictate on a diet that comes from our sense of right and wrong or our sense of need is the wrong diet. We move this out of the way. And here's that right there. Huh? It's just fine. No cover at all. We plant this in October, and it's still very small. But in the spring, it'll be huge. It grows really big, doesn't need any protection. It does not being affected by the frost at all right now. Um, so just this space, maybe 2,000 pounds of spinach from a section that really took no work except to prepare the beds, seed, and cover. You can see there's, there's no damage at all. I think for the future, the right way to think about this is to get away from looking at what we covet and look more towards what the land wants to produce. I mean, it's perfectly healthy and still growing. It may be frozen, but very sweet. We have to eat a diverse diet. That's the challenge. And that, that means I have to create the dishes yeah. and the menu uh, that that people want to eat and that can they can easily replicate in their own homes. I mean that's that's where cuisine comes in. It's like you don't just have that restaurants. You have that in your daily diet, and it becomes part of the culture of eating. That's the that's the key. Look tonight, I'm working on a carrot steak. So we have carrots that are in storage now. Looks like a pork foot. That's a carrot. Wow. We've been aging it in beef fat. So we'll take off most of the fat. And tonight we're going to serve this like a steak. But the architecture of the dish is going to flip on its head. It's going to be the American ideal reversed. My hope is that we do that with a, a lot of dishes and that ultimately we can create a system and a pattern of eating that is more reflective of what this can provide. Mm -hmm. Not what we expect this to provide, but the other way around. And it's a big difference. Barber believes that if we just eat what the land gives us, there will be more than enough for everyone, now and in the future. But how can we get ourselves to actually eat all these less common ingredients? Technology could help us with this as well. Hey Steve, hop to the dommel, you man. My hand goed. Ja, kijk maar dan weer. Ah, goed hè man. Super. Kijk, wat ben je mee voor dat ding? En je weet je de onze bivangst die van gister. Dat is de bivangst die normaal altijd overboord wordt. Hey, ik daar is hij dus de steenbolk. Ah ja. Prachtig vestje. Dat is dus de steenbolk hier, hè? Oké. Dus wat heb je dan in? Nog een ander schoen exemplaar, niet gekend bij de bij de consument, totaal niet. Dat is de Schotse schar. Dat vangen we hier ook in onze noordje. En die vesten waren ik altijd, altijd continu weggegooid. Ja, maar we vroegen vertrokken op zee, wat brachten we er mee? Alleen maar de, de, de tong, de tarbot, de kabeljo, hetgeen aan de meesten kennen. Ja. En hoeveel, hoeveel vesten heb je dan mee? Maar nu, de, deze week, hebben we 25 ton vest mee. Dus dat is niet, uh, niet verkeerd.
En, en hoeveel is dan, hoeveel is dan en van onze, B-vangst? De B-vangst moet je zeggen, nemen we nu 50% B-vangst mee. 50% nemen we nu mee. 50% van maar vroeg... die vissen en die vissen worden weggegooid. Ja. Vroeger werd dat weggegooid. Ja. Goed, hè? En zo laag dat dat is, hè? dat is... Ja, vroeger was dat een minderwaardigheidsvisje, ja. Een minderwaardigheidsvisje. Ja. Dat werd echt niet uitgesmeten. We brachten dat niet mee, nooit. Is dat lekker, dit? Man, ga je het wat vertellen, hè? Alles dat in onze zie is zwemt, is super lekker. <laughs> oh, wel, mogen we naar mee doen? Naar ons labo. We gaan kijken welke smaken er erin zitten, welke aroma's. En dan gaan we zien wat er om je samen past. Years ago, Johan Langenbeek founded the food tech startup Food Pairing together with Bernard Laus. They want to analyze all the ingredients in the world and create a database of all the aromas contained in them. Hey, Morgen, Dag nou Bernard. Hey, the bycatch of the day. Als je eet, is aroma het meest belangrijke. 80% van hetgeen je proeft wordt eigenlijk door, door je neus bepaald. Nu gaan wij niet ruiken, maar we gaan toestellen laten ruiken. We gaan toestellen de aroma's laten analyseren, bijvoorbeeld van de steenmolk, omdat wij willen weten hoe die aroma's gaan interageren met andere aroma's. Om zodanig kunnen wij zien welke ingrediënten zullen perfect bij elkaar passen. Super. Oké. Okay. Dan gaan we aan de slag gaan. Perfect. Dus we gaan die aroma's gaan analyseren. Maar natuurlijk, een, een mensenneus werd anders dan een, een toestel. Dus die vertaalslag hebben wij uh, gemaakt. Omdat wij... Uh, ik kan een voorbeeldje geven van, van, van de steenwolk. Um, als je naar, uh, naar het aromaprofiel van, uh, van de steenwolk kijkt, yeah. dan zie je daar bijvoorbeeld uh, vanille in voorkomen. Um, zie je daar groene komkommerachtige uh, aroma's uh, in voorkomen. Uh, florale, honingachtige componenten. Maar natuurlijk, als wij... Als, uh, als persoon een steenbol kruiken, gaan we niet zeggen van uh, het is honing, komkommer, vanille. We gaan daar eigenlijk één uh, aromabeeld van maken. En het is dat aromabeeld dat voor ons, voor de mens dan, overeenkomt met, met steenbol. Maar wij gaan die echt in, de, in delen gaan, uh, gaan uitsplitsen. Mm-hmm. Zodat wij volledig weten van oké, okay, steenbol, dit zijn de aromas die, die belangrijk zijn. Uh, en op basis daarvan kunnen we dan zien hoe het popcorn cruciaal Popcorn is ook cruciaal voor het korst. Vers broodaroma is heel sterk door popcorn bepaald. Dus we kunnen die combinatie met, uh, met, met brood gaan maken of komkommer. Maar komkommeraroma is ook belangrijk voor watermeloen. Dus we kunnen in de watermeloenrichting gaan. En zo kunnen we eigenlijk heel creatief aan de slag gaan met uh, nieuwe combinaties met uh, een vis waar men soms niet goed mee weet welke combinaties men, uh, men kan doen. Goedemorgen, met Pieter. Een vis mee? Ja, dank u. We zijn er met de vis. Voilà. Het is een softwareprogramma, dus de, de algoritmes die, uh, die daarop draaien, die gebeuren op de computer. Het is niet dat wij manueel of dingen zelf gaan uittesten. Nee, wij voeren de resultaten van de analyses in. En er zitten een aantal algoritmes op. En die geven als resultaat brood, krap, komkommer, als, als combinatie die je kan gaan maken met, uh, met de steenbolk. Bruin bier en honing. Uh-huh. Intuïtief doet een chef dat al. Maar die kan nooit zo in detail gaan als dat een, een, een toestel maakt. Dus wij maken echt een, een, een detail. We weten alle aromamoleculen in de producten en gaan dus die interacties gaan, gaan bekijken. Op die uh, zuurdesem? Ja. Nee. Eigenlijk gaan we op zoek naar aromas die gemeenschappelijk zijn tussen producten. Dus in het geval van de komkommer. Uh-huh. Het komkommeraroma die hierin zit, is ook het komkommeraroma die in komkommer zit. Dus ik kan... Deze vis gaan combineren met komkommer. Ik zie hier citrus staan. 
Uh, ik zie hier honing staan. Maar goed, dat honingaroma uh, komt ook voor in witte wijn of in kaas. Dus je kan witte wijn, kaas, honing gaan combineren met, uh, met dit product. Nog eens bij, maar iets van groenten eventueel. Er komen zeker combinaties die nog nooit iemand aan gedacht heeft, omdat men bijvoorbeeld een Koreaans ingrediënt ideaal kan combineren met een Peruaans ingrediënt. Die hebben elkaar nog nooit gevonden in de keuken, maar wij kunnen die wel detecteren omdat wij de aroma's van de twee producten beschikbaar hebben. Gerookt, gerookte steenbolk, hoppenscheuten, San Francisco brood, een cuvée en lavendelhoning. En lavendelhoning. Super. Voilà. Oké. Okay. Dan gaat hij blij zijn. Van de mango weten wij van wat zijn de key aromas in een mango. Wat bepaalt het aroma van de mango? Maar zoals aangehaald, een, een, een key aroma uit mango kan ook voorkomen in, in appel. Uh, of in andere producten. Dus wij kunnen gaan kijken van hoe kunnen we aan de hand van combinaties van lokale producten een mango maken. Uh, op onze blog kun je een voorbeeld vinden van uh, appelsien. We zijn gaan kijken van wat hebben wij beschikbaar in 20 kilometer rond, uh, rond het bedrijf. En uh, welke combinaties kun je dan gaan maken? En dan zie je dat we eigenlijk appelsien kunnen gaan opnieuw maken door een combinatie van uh, meloen, uh, fisalis, geneverbes. Uh, kruisbes en in de juiste hoeveelheid geeft dat opnieuw terug appelsien. Dus die technologie kunnen we wel degelijk ook gebruiken om producten opnieuw te gaan of producten te gaan uh, vervangen met uh, lokale ingrediënten. We gaan gewoon alle producten ter wereld uh, analyseren als het tool en we zitten maar nog een klein stukje, maar uh, ooit zullen we er wel uh, raken. Je ziet mooi. Dat visje net haar genoeg is om te eten. Ja. Maar nog alle sap heeft behouden. Er is niks van jus uit de vis gelopen. Alles, alles zit er nog in. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries. <laughs>